All right, hello, my name is Jonathan Millard. I'm uh, an anatomist at the Edward Via College of Osteopathic Medicine in, in Blacksburg, Virginia. And my, my talk today is going to be on the anatomy of Chiari, probably unsurprisingly. I want to look at uh, maybe some of the history of the anatomy uh, and, and anatomical research targets of interest and, and what that could look like in the future. I want to talk about the uh, I want to talk about this the, this content using cadaveric material. So I will have uh, along the way some pictures and, and videos of these dissections, not not just of the um, you know specific research targets, but also just you know just anatomical content that's in the neighborhood and, and in in the area. Um, I think it's it's neat and interesting and empowering for people to be able to see a lot of this anatomy. And I want to thank my students who have worked with me on this. They have performed a lot of this uh, dissection, as you'll see. They've done, they've done a really great job to reveal a lot of the anatomy. Uh, Sydney Moriarty, Maya Mahoney, Ishan Pereira, and, and Zachary Simmons. I want to thank them for that. Also, the Virginia State Anatomical Program, uh, an agency of the Virginia Department of Health, and, and uh, Mr. R uh, Richard Sycon up there, uh, the director. I was talking to him about... Um, uh, this presentation actually making sure that you know it'd be okay to, to use this cadaveric material for for this presentation and he he actually told me that his son had Chiari malformation and and uh, uh, is, is now you know several years uh, post-op and is doing doing a lot better so I think it's uh, just a neat connection to make there and a, and a reminder to uh, I think researchers particularly non-clinicians that you know this is uh, a very real condition out there affecting uh, affecting people. So, uh, my objectives: one, to define Chiari malformation, what it is. A lot of this will be uh, not new to a lot of people, but I do want to hit on it briefly. Talk about uh, a lot of the morphometric features of interest that people have used in the past to, you know, gauge uh, gauge the disease, to consider, uh, you know, uh, as as landmarks for clinical decision making and things like that. Talk about some of the newer. Uh, research targets and, and places of interest um, as, as far as research goes and then use those cadaveric material along the way to, to assist with that. So as a definition, Chiari 1 malformation is a descent, dis defined as a descent of the cerebellum below five millimeters from McRae's line. So this line from basion to opistheon on the occipital bone, cerebellum can descend down from there and uh, pass that, that point. So on a perpendicular line there, the cerebellum coming down and greater than five millimeters could could trigger a Chiari diagnosis. Hydrocephalus kind of uncommon with this, although it, ha it does happen. And Syringomyelia a little more common. I can see this individual here was uh, so I can see the the brainstem and the cerebellum here with a little bit of descent, and there was a syrinx associated with that. So this is a syrinx inside of the spinal cord, which uh, resolved after after an operation. So I want to use this video here to to talk about some of those points. So this is the anterior view of the brainstem and the cerebellum. This is the medulla and the pons, and then the midbrain up here at the top, and you see a lot of the vessels of uh, what's called posterior circulation back there. Um, you can see the spinal cord down here at the bottom, and these little bumps on the side of the uh, medulla called the olive with the uh, hypoglossal nerve popping out there. You'll see on the side, as I open the space up, there's a little CSF space of interest here. I can actually see some choroid plexus spilling out of that hole. This is the foramen of Lushka. So that fourth ventricle that you see there in the mid-sagittal plane, there's a couple of ways out of there. And the foramen Lushka bilaterally, you will see that on either side there, close to cranial nerve 7 and 8 um, at the cerebellopontine angle. Moving on a little further there. Um, you see sweeping away some of the arachnoid mater. So this is the arachnoid mater in life is inflated against the uh, against the dura due to the pressure of the CSF. A lateral view of the cerebellum here with the, the folia looking down the quadrigeminal cistern with the inferior colliculi. This is the uh, cerebral aqueduct here. So there's the cerebral aqueduct and the bumps on the superior colliculus. And this is again an important part of that uh, ventricular system story where the CSF will communicate from the third ventricle down to that fourth ventricle between the pons and the cerebellum. Looking at the inferior view, you can see more arachnoid that I just pull out of the way. The cerebellar tonsils here being revealed. I can see some of the blood supply, the posterior inferior cerebellar artery, and those tonsils just popping free. See the 11th nerve there on the side of the, of the cord. Uh, also there, this little hole is uh, looking into where foramen magendi would be. So foramen magendi also communicating with that fourth ventricle. And um, 
and uh, an important element, obviously, for CSF, for cerebrospinal fluid, to get out of that fourth ventricle and into the subarachnoid space, uh, where it will then uh, bathe the central nervous system freely. So a little further here, I'll advance the video. So I'll just make a cut down the middle. So I'll cut down the middle, do my best to hit it down the middle, and I get through the cerebral aqueduct and through the vermis of the cerebellum here in the midline, the cerebellar vermis. Here now I see in the midline, this is exactly what you would see in a, in a mid-sagittal MRI, right? So you would see the uh, midbrain, uh, mid and there's the pons, there's the medulla, and then the cord. See our cerebellum in the midline. You can see the tectum there and the cerebral aqueduct, that little hole there com communicating the third and the fourth ventricle. There's that fourth ventricle. Uh, you can see a lot of uh, choroid plexus here in the fourth ventricle and the opening there for foramen lushka on the side. So this is the lining of that fourth ventricle that you see so famously in the, in the mid-sagittal view. Picking away a little of the uh, arachnoid mater, uh, kind of exaggerating the primary fissure of the cerebellum. Just a nice view of the the, tr uh, the path of that CSF as it would travel through. Uh, type two Chiari is a, is a more aggressive descent, and, and two and three are related to uh, their you know, neural tube like dysraphic conditions, neural tube defects, and the uh, descent of the vermis and even you know some of the fourth ventricle through that foramen. So a much greater um, descent. This is very often associated with myelomeningocele. So this is a lumbar myelomeningocele. On a, on a newborn, and this is associated with Chiari too. Also, uh, syrinx and uh, hydrocephalus are quite common. This is just a picture of that cerebellum there that I was showing you, and I've, I've cut actually the cord here so you can see this little white outline of this little H shape. So this is a myelin stained C1 section through the cord, and the central canal cannot even be seen here in this image. It will be somewhere around in there. And it's very, very small, but that, the central canal is what's responsible for the syringomyelia, right? So we can see that syrinx here and the developing of the spinal cord. It's amazing really how how much the, the spinal cord and the ascending and descending tracts can withstand, but that's where you would see that develop. Chiari 3 relatively rare, also a dysphraphic condition categorized by this oxephal, uh, encephalus seal, so some brain contents herniating out of the back. Um, there are other uh, nervous system uh, malformations associated with that as well. Chiari 4, perhaps even more rare, so we see um, cerebellar hypoplasia, so the cerebellum sitting in the back there would be hypoplastic, it's not completely um, developed. These folks often have like lacunar skulls, so these skulls are not completely formed and uh, this results in, you know, uh, herniations like the, uh, we can see here some of the cerebrum herniating out, actually. So uh, the focus of my talk really will be less so about these dysphoric conditions, more about Chiari 1 malformations. A lot of interest in this, obviously, and a lot of mystery that swirls around this um, from a research standpoint. So looking at this MRI, so what are some things we've looked at in the past? What do we know? So there's, a, there's some things that, that we know here on this mid-sagittal view, is, and it's been a, you know, a, a, an important focus of research uh, attention. So we see things we know. We see the cerebrum. In the corpus callosum, some nice landmarks in the cerebellum there in the posterior cranial fossa. We can also see the brain stem, see the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla, and the spinal cord. Also, we see here uh, McRae's line. So, McRae's line is that line defining this tonsil ectopia. So, if you have this cerebellar descent here, if it's greater than five millimeters, that's where you would get that um, Chiari uh, diagnosis. We see that little diamond shape on the fourth ventricle and the nodulus there on the cerebellum. Um, other lines of interest are Chamberlain's lines. A Chamberlain's line coming from a pistion on the back of the occipital bone and going to the hard palate. So this is the hard palate and this is the soft palate. And this is a proxy for basilar invagination, which is associated with uh, Chiari malformation. So it's, a, it's very much uh, you know, you're familiar with the, uh, uh, they often will trot out the, the example of uh, you know, like a cork inside of a, a wine bottle. It's just things not fitting together quite well. There could be a lot of things contributing to that. So. Uh, McGregor's line being another line, kind of a modified Chamberlain's line to look at uh, basilar invagination if the epistheon's not in view. So we, here are other examples. I won't go through all of this. this. is probably the focus of other talks and um, a lot of research that people are very interested in. A lot of research that Conquer Chiari has been heavily involved in. Um, but looking at these different lines and measurements and angles between those lines and measurements and just looking and probing to see if there are... are um, 
specific angles, specific lines, which are which are uh, salient and different uh, in Chiari folks, which you know gives some uh, power to, to to clinical decisions and prognosis and things like this. So I just want to show you this video here. So this video you can see the brain stem and the cerebellum. Uh, down here you can also see I've sectioned the C2 uh, vertebra here. So this is C2. Here's the dens and this is the body of C2. There's the anterior arch on C1 right here and there's the spinal cord. So I'd already have done a lot of dissection up to this point. So um, advancing that a little further there so you can see those those bones and you can also see uh, so here's a tonsil down there at the bottom so the back of foramen and magnum would be somewhere about here it's been removed um, another important feature famously here is the clivus so the clivus here and this is the sphenoid sinus and this is the pituitary gland so right here is the pituitary gland and its infundibulum of course uh, Features like empty cell and stuff are often associated with Chiari malformation. Um, so here's here's that pituitary gland. So what I want to focus on really is craniocervical instability. I want to talk about this and some um, interesting anatomical targets here. So craniocervical instability. So this is uh, a disorder related to um, incongruous articulations related to um, a lot of laxity in joints and uh, ligaments. So all of our bones are connected together by ligaments, and these ligaments are made of t connective tissues of different types. There's different fiber types, and people can have uh, mutations, and this can be passed on, this can be hereditary, to where these joints are very, very lax, and there's a lot of abnormal amount of, of bony movement translation, and there's a lot of excess of ability of flexion extension and things like this because of those ligaments. The fibers in them are not quite right, and they al allow too much movement. So examples of that are like Ehlers-Danlos and uh, Lois Dietz syndrome have been they've been linked with this Chiari malformation. So uh, a seminal paper and that was was uh, published in 2007, looking at this, and this launched a lot of interest related to these uh, connection between Chiari malformation and connective tissue um, disorders. And this they're looking at the effects of uh, gravity in this case like in an individual being supine versus an individual sitting up uh, versus when they add traction so there's just too much excess movement there's too much translation there's too much uh, uh, incongruent you know uh, motion really between all of these bones due to the fact that the ligaments which are responsible for these bones are, are not um, are not doing the job that they should they're, they're too lax okay so a lot of those findings included um, a lot of excess gliding of the occipital condyles and uh, depending on the uh, the posture of the individual the uh, bony relationships may not be held as tightly as they should be and may be too loose and this could affect the flow of the cerebral spinal fluid around the outside so their uh, Chiari 1 being uh, associated with that was a primary finding of that of that report so as an anatomist, I'm always thinking about you know joints in general and and their and the what we call the great joint compromise, which is um, the trade-off of mobility versus stability. So the more stable a joint gets with strong ligamentous connections, um, the less mobile it gets. So an example of that would be like the su sutural um, joints on the skull, the sternoclavicular joint, quite strong, not a lot of mobility in these joints, and there's a smooth gradation up towards. Uh, um, instability but more mobility so the vertebral column largely is uh, a step toward the the more mobile direction but still quite stable the knee somewhere probably in the middle so it's a nice hinge joint so you can you'll notice a lot of nice flexion extension motion in your knee but it doesn't move side to side very well your hip joint even even more mobile than your knee if you think about how you can move your hip it's it's pretty mobile right you can move it in all directions circumduct it and a lot of nice abduction there within with the hip Probably the most mobile, or the one that's uh, trotted out often as being a very um, famous mobile joint, or infamous maybe, <laughs> maybe too too mobile, is the shoulder joint. Um, so you could just just imagine how how freely your shoulder is able to move, and it's it's very mobile. But the trade-off there is the shoulder is very unstable. So where would I put the OA and the AA joints on there? Where would I put the um, occipital bone on C1 and then C1 on C2. I would say they're I would say they're definitely more toward the mobile side. They're very very mobile. And it's unique from the rest of the vertebral column, and because these have very specialized uh, ranges of motion that the rest of the vertebral column is not really looking at. So, as an image I show my students is 
that C1 and C2's uh, d degree of axial rotation is the overwhelming majority of, of where that axial rotation, like you're shaking your head no, coming from the C1, C2 joint. Similarly, um, the occipital joint really doesn't help much with shaking your head no, but it does help quite a bit shaking your head yes. So those two joints, the AO joint and the AA joint, excuse me, are very, very mobile, uniquely so, in these directions. So um, the ligaments that support them then are, are uh, how they work. They, ne they need to be relying on them to work very well in order to make sure that the normal motion and the normal range of motion is conserved and acting the way it should. So this is a dissection showing you uh, through the, the posterior arch of the um, the, the, the neural arch on a lot of the vertebrae and then the atlas here and you can see the PLL, the posterior longitudinal ligament. It's one of those uh, very strong ligaments like a band that runs all the way up to here is the clivus. And this will limit the amount of flexion that you have forward and also limits the amount of translation that one would have uh, the occipital bone on, on the atlas. So if you were to scrape this away you would look down and see something like this. You would see the, the dens is right underneath there <clears throat> and I can see coming away um, from the atlas uh, attaching up to the occipital bone is the alar ligament. So the alar ligament here and here. So those alar ligaments helping the tectoral membrane and also prevents a lot of excess axial rotation. Um, a small little apical ligament there and then uh, another famous ligament, the transverse ligament of the atlas. So this is a very thick ligament as you'll see I have a dissection. You'll be able to see this going across that dens and right here from a superior view looking down Here's the dense. If you look down on it, that transverse ligament of the atlas is very important in keeping it nestled into where it should be. If it gets too lax and there's, there's too much mobility in there, you can end up with problems. Okay, so all these are contributing to um, posteriorly to the craniocervical junction. Anteriorly, we have uh, the joint capsule, so the occipital membrane, and then these joint capsules, which you'll see all along the way. So these are responsible and then an anterior longitudinal ligament to complement the posterior longitudinal ligament. So all these ligaments are, uh, many of them as you now know, and they're very, they're very salient in um, keeping, the, keep, keeping the craniocervical junction um, stable. The muscles that overlie the region, often the famous muscles are called the suboccipital muscle group. So the suboccipital muscles you'll see are hot, very heavily associated with C1 and C2. So this here is the bifid spinous process on C2 and there's the posterior tubercle on C1. So we can see uh, several muscles here, rectus capitis, posterior minor and major. Here's obliquus capitis inferior and obliquus capitis superior. And inside of that little hole there is, is what's called the uh, suboccipital triangle. So in addition to these ligaments, these muscles are also important in keeping that, keeping that craniocervical junction stable. And, and this is important because of a uh, gaining, the, the, you know, rising interest in what's called the myodural bridge complex. So the myodural bridge complex is, is shown here. And what this is getting at is the fact that the, if you break the word down, myodural is looking at myo meaning muscles and dura referring to the dura mater. So in this picture you can see the cerebellum and then the spinal cord here. And this is the inside of the dura mater. And they have located and they've, they've confirmed there's been a lot of interest in this looking at these connections from these muscles. So this is a mid-sagittal view and this is a section looking at these muscles. So this is a muscle here, obliquus inferior, uh, rectus capitis posterior major, rectus capitis posterior minor, those ones we just looked at. And you can see they have these little striations and connections with the dura mater on the inside. So when this muscle fib uh, these muscles fire, this bridging complex can change the shape of the dura on the inside. Uh, which is interesting. So this has kind of grown over time. So starting in uh, the 90s, they were started to find these little connections. Um, they found some connections with the nuchal ligament, this thick ligament on the back of your neck, and then kind of bit by bit, they started connecting one muscle to the next and said, "Hey, there's a lot of there's a lot of you know pretty intricate connections here." And a lot of those connections are shown in blue on this image on the left side. This has gained a lot of steam. Um, and there's you know a, a lot of ideas about what this could be. Why 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 is this connected the way it is? Um, does this have something to do with the fact that the CSF is this assisting the CSF? You know, does this is this when the muscles fire, are they pulling the dura, which causes a negative pressure, which is encouraging CSF flow? So a lot of uh, theories that are swirling about this. Um, so uh, a recent study that came out looking at this 
It was just published in July of this year. So looking at one thing is just looking at generalized uh, stability. So if you have one of these maybe uh, conditions, one of these connective tissue disorders, and you're, uh, and you're unstable at these joints, so if this stability is down on those joints due to this connective tissue disorder, this increase could increase the workload on the suboccipital muscles. So those muscles we looked at, they may have to work double time to keep everything stable if the ligaments are not holding the way they should. And so this is possible then that if those muscles are overworked, then their effect on the dura will be overworked. It'll be exaggerated, right? Because they're connected to that to, connected to that dura mater. So that myodural bridge complex pulling on that dura mater could be increased. And uh, some of the thought is that this may be, result in uh, a lack of dural compliance or a decrease in dural compliance so the dura will not be as compliant as it was in the past, and this could disrupt the normal flow of cerebrospinal fluid. And in this study um, that, they've, that they've published now, they've injected um, some rats as, a, as an animal model. They've injected some rats, and what they did was they uh, injected it with something that would uh, break down some of these tissues and cause um, hypertrophy of the muscles. So we see here, this is, uh, so three groups, they had um, the experimental group, and then they had a control group, and then they, they did a procedure with uh, just a saline solution where they injected saline solution to test, and they saw this procedural group um, had a lot more muscle fibers indicating that these muscles could be overworked and a lot of hypertrophy in the area of these connective tissues. So this is important. This is interesting, right? And, and, and um, they are connecting this heavily then with Chiari malformation. So look at the suboccipital region here really quick. So we saw those muscles. I just want to point them out here because I'll show you a video now. Um, there's obliquus capitis inferior, obliquus capitis superior, rectus capitis posterior major, and minors hiding behind there. We see some, a lot of nerves and arteries popping out. So this is deep down in there, as you'll see. So this is a dissection. My students did a great job with this, really. So uh, thank you to them. You can see this is where C2 would be. We'll go ahead and start the video. This is where C2 would be. C1 here, I can see rectus capitis major and minor, obliquus inferior, and then down in that hole there is the suboccipital triangle, and this is the sub obliquus capitis uh, superior. So there's a nerve here that's uh, associated with occipital neuralgia. It's a greater occipital nerve, and there's the occipital artery. Looking down inside there, you can see the atlas. That's it. That is the atlas and the suboccipital nerve popping out, the vertebral artery running over, suboccipital nerve popping out, dorsal ramus of C1 innervating those muscles. So what they found in that study was that these muscles were hypertrophied. They were really, really thick. You can see there that vertebral artery on the inside. So this is, this is it. That is the atlas right there. And these muscles in these uh, animal models are quite thick. So could they be thicker in humans? Um, uh, in some instances of Chiari malformation, I don't know. It'd be a good that would be a good research question. So I, I went a little further in, and I took out a chunk of the occipital bone just so you could see the cerebellum here in the back. So there's the cerebellar tonsils here, in the, or the hemispheres out here on the on the side, and I put a pin through the inside of the dura mater in that. Uh, so this this pin is running from inside out. So I put a pin through the through the dura on the inside that will poke all the way on the back side would be where the posterior occipital membrane would be. Um, <clears throat> so this is kind of where you saw that uh, result on that one uh, mouse study that we looked at. Okay, so in this I uh, went a little bit deeper here with this dissection and you can see um, so these are the occipital condyles. I'll start the video here but I wanted to show you some of the motion um, that occurs here. So a lot of motion at these at these joints. So you can see here, this is the uh, transverse uh, ligament of the uh, of the atlas. I'll pull it out of the way. You can see how thick it is. That's a very thick ligament that reveals um, the dens. So the dens is being held down by that. There's the occipital condyles. Okay, so the shapes of the occipital condyles are interesting and um, could could be related to Chiari malformations. Um, but the the ligaments really are what we're we're focused on here. And you can see as I rotate this around. Um, putting the neck into flexion and extension. There's a lot of mobility there. Of course, the joint spaces are open, exaggerating that. So there's a lot of motion there. There's a lot of potential motion, particularly if your ligaments are too lax. Okay. So other muscles that, you know, as soon as I, I, I thought about, uh, read the outcomes of that study, I thought, well, what about these other muscles? There's other muscles, actually, that are on the front side. Um, and no one ever thinks about these. No one, including me, including me. I up until this uh, time, I have never dissected them. Not one time. They're kind of an afterthought in the dissection. I think for a lot of reasons. They're not horribly consequential from a biomechanical standpoint. 
And um, in order to get to them, you, you have to sacrifice a lot of the other anatomy. But there's muscles on the back, the rectus capitis posterior muscles. There's like re uh, rectus capitis lateralis over here on the side, on the transverse uh, process of, of C1. There's the styloid process here. There's also a rectus capitis anterior and a longus capitis muscle that will come all the way up. And these are, these are quite thick. I mean, these are... Uh, very robust muscles actually on the front side. So this is the occipital bone here where I'm pointing and this is C1. Um, so I'd be curious to see how, how these muscles act as well. So in this dissection, this is the only time I've ever done this dissection actually to recreate this picture. This, um, so I uh, dissected down to the spinal column from the front side. So this is recreating that image there. So you can see longus capitis here. Over here on the side, right there is a good picture. You can see the styloid process like you see there. And those two muscles, rectus capitis lateralis and anterior. So there's rectus capitis lateralis and anterior. So you can see there, it's probably on the continuum of, uh, uh, in size anyway, is rectus capitis posterior muscles. And they're nestled, they're nestled right up on, on that uh, uh, um, AO joint, right? So they're having a lot of activity. Um, in the case of the rectus capitis lateralis and anterior acting exclusively at the AO joint. You can see the longus capitis muscle bunch up there uh, simulating flexion. Okay, so uh, moving on really quick, I want to see the top here. So you can see this is a view of the brain open and uh, I just want to show you so, some of the destination of that CSF. So this is the superior sagittal sinus and the superior sagittal sinus will drain down to the confluence. And another important part of making sure that the CSF is flowing the way it should is getting rid of it. So these are these arachnoid granulations here that you see. And this is how the CSF uh, will eventually empty out um, into the same channels as the blood. And those sterile venous sinuses, as you'll see I open here, this is really just kind of think of them as veins for your, for your brain. And the old CSF is going out of those uh, veins, if you will. So in closing, I want to talk really quickly about some uh, cranial nerve signs. So cranial nerve signs often associated with Chiari, so I'll start this video. And want to point these out. I mean, see the lower cranial nerve signs. So uh, there's a lot of interesting case reports and things looking at these lower cranial nerves, um, 6 through 12, basically. And you can see that here. So in this picture, this is a, a cut through the, the cranial fossa. So this cut is like through here. And the cerebrum and the cerebellum have been totally removed. So in this picture, I can see the tentorium, and the tentorium has been cut here. Excuse me, I, I cut the tentorium. You can see where I made those holes from the outside. You can see them there. So I want to zero in on this clivus. So there's the clivus. There's the pituitary stalk. So down in there would be where the pituitary would sit. So this is the clivus. So right on there is where you'll see these nerves. Okay, so these nerves being put under stress, uh, uh, being put under traction, etc., can cause these symptoms. The fifth nerve. There's the sixth nerve. Very thin. It's thread thin. Um, so often associated with Chiari malformation of Dusen's nerve, 7 and 8, uh, the facial nerve and the vestibulocochlear nerve. Then you'll see 9, 10, and 11 out here at the bottom as well. So these are hypoglossal and um, vagus and glossopharyngeal. Or excuse me, uh, vagus, um, glossopharyngeal, and accessory nerves. Down here in the middle is where you see the hypoglossal nerve. So all of these have been uh, connected to some form and fashion with the with the Chiari malformation. So um, future directions I think that are interesting and cool. One is soft tissue targets. As an anatomist this excites me a lot. There's still, as I've demonstrated, a lot of muscles out there to see and consider and think about. Um, moving into imaging studies, looking at these uh, the sizes of these muscles, you know, I think that's also something cool. Also, as an anatomist, I'm interested in uh, measurements. So, uh, taking measurements is, is, has been a very important part in directing Chiari research and making clinical decisions. And uh, so, I want to I would like to extend these measurements beyond that into three dimensions. So, I think the future is future is parasagittal. The future is three dimensions. So, right now, this is. Uh, I think a, a, perhaps a cool way to, to sophisticate our, our understanding of this. If I can pull out, there's a couple of images I pulled out. Um, I was able to pull out the atlas and the axis and uh, use uh, geometric morphometric techniques to evaluate these shapes. You know, if I can, instead of just you know, looking unidimensionally at the clivus, if I can look at the whole clivus and say, um, isolate the bones entirely, for example, I think that could be a cool way forward. And I think one, it would, be allow, it would allow you to um, isolate Chiari variables and 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 see if there's uh, anything of interest there. 
um, stimulate other kinds of studies, developmental studies, genetic studies as well. And, you know, if I could if I could point to certain parts of bones or certain soft tissues and and say um, this specifically is is significantly different in Chiari groups, and also you know give clinicians more objective reasons to make decisions. I think that is a lot of the goal is is giving people clear paths for for good reasons. You know, so uh, it's been a great pleasure meeting and and, and talking with you all. Uh, I want to thank uh, Rick Labuda and, 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 and Dr. Frank Law for all their help. Rick Labuda, is, uh, he's an absolute bloodhound. I mean, he is, he is on a mission. The people of Conquer Chiari are doing cool things. So I appreciate he and uh, Dr. Frank Law uh, placating a lot of my interest in Chiari and uh, look forward to what the future holds. So thank you.